I'm going to talk to you now about the disability legislation because it had a long and tortuous history and journey. And it has its origins in the recommendations of the Commission on the status of people with disabilities dating back to 1996. And the Disability Bill, we ended up with the Disability Bill in 2001, which was withdrawn in February 2002, following opposition from disability groups and disability rights campaigners. Now the history, we were very familiar with the history of disability charity driven largely by Catholic institutions, is now driven by a public commitment to mainstreaming equality of opportunity, also social inclusion, and more recently, human rights. And what followed um, the falling of the bill was a series of public protests and meetings which heralded the arrival of disabled people's civil rights movement in Ireland. So while people had been aware of what was going on internationally, the frustration of the journey of the Disability in Act in Ireland was such that people went, took to the streets and decided that they'd had enough. And the argument, the tipping point really was about providing legislation that would allow people to go to court and the judici justiciability of human rights. What I'd like to do now is just talk to you about the disability legislation and its long and tortuous journey and how that journey was actually instrumental in terms of people with disabilities themselves having a voice. And it has its origins in the recommendation of the Commission, as I mentioned, on the status of people with disabilities in 1996. And we ended up with the Disability Bill in 2001, which was withdrawn in February 2002, a year later. And it was following opposition from disability groups and disability rights campaigners. And this was largely because of the lack of enforcement of disability rights, in particular in the courts. And while the history of disability, the charity driven largely by Catholic institutions, is now moving to a public commitment to mainstreaming equality of opportunity, to social inclusion, and then more recently, human rights. But when that bill fell, what followed was a series of public protests and meetings, which is described by Judy Walsh, who's been prolific on her writings in equality and human rights, as heralding the arrival of disabled people's civil rights movements in Ireland. The Supreme Court judgment happened just around the same time as the Disability Bill was published in 2001. People will remember Jamie Sinnott, a young man with autism, whose mother fought uh, and took uh, years to get through the courts to finally getting to the Supreme Court judgment which was instrumental in accelerating disability rights because it accelerated two things. One was political action on disability rights. It jolted the political system into understanding that they had an obligation for people with disability. And the second was that it attracted huge media and public support. And if anything, it propelled a social movement. It really garnered uh, support from people um, outside the disability sector and disability, disability activism. And one of the key stumbling blocks um, to the Disability Act that continued to progress after that was Section 47, which provided that no element of the legislation could be enforced in the court. And if anything, post the Senate judgment, they were even more adamant not to legislate or include in legislation rights that could be enforced in the court. People will remember the late Donal Tulin, an incredible human being, but Donal said that the disability bill appeared to be an attempt to restrict the use of the court's system to vindicate rights where agreed actions were not forthcoming. And to date, uh, that remains where we are in terms of the enforceability of rights in the court. The bill collapsed, putting disability rights firmly back on the political agenda. And then a body called the DLCG was set up, the Disability Legislation Consultation Group, 
was established from eight disability organisations. And in the Act, really what it boiled down to was a statutory entitlement. And we've heard this recently from parents in the media about the entitlement to an assessment for help and education needs, which is a, a very minimal approach to the provision of disability rights. Certainly the disability sector and laterally the human rights, broader human rights sector, advance a much more expansive version of disability, act, disability rights. And the Disability Act is considered by many to represent a missed opportunity in terms of safeguarding disability rights in Ireland, notwithstanding the very uh, great efforts by people with disability, by their families, by their carers, by people who were advocating for them, who fought long and hard for the Disability Act. Looking now to international human rights law, because what I'm well aware that Anya Flynn is coming behind me and then Michael Keating from HICWA, and I'm trying not to overlap with what they might say in terms of national legislation. So I'm going to move to the international framework and international human rights law. And by rat ratifying a treaty, a state assumes obligations to respect, to protect, and to fulfill. And an obligation to respect means that the state must refrain from interfering with or containing the enjoyment of human rights. An obligation to protect requires the states to protect individuals and to groups against human rights abuses. And an obligation to fulfil and that fulfilling, often the burden of fulfilling those obligations fall mainly on the state, but doesn't mean that the rest of us can't take any action. But the obligation to fulfill means the state must take positive action to facilitate the enjoyment of basic rights. Now, in the context of providing a service, you have a job to, in particular, to respect human rights, to make sure and to consider any of the practices or policies that exist in your organization, respect human rights, which means you make every effort not to interfere with or curtail the potential enjoyment of human rights. And that you don't simply see yourselves as protector of human rights, but people with power to write policies, to guide practice that makes sure that people have an experience of enjoyment of human rights. In terms of the approach specific to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, which Ireland ratified finally as the last country in the European Union ratified in 2018, there are a few important uh, things to consider about it. The first is that it does not introduce any new rights. Ireland has signed a significant number of UN treaties and the rights contained in the Convention on People with Disabilities exist in other treaties. What it does do is it seeks ways to support and celebrate human diversity by creating conditions that allow for meaningful participation by everybody, including people with disabilities. So you heard me in the last slide talk about the, um, the negative side, if you like, of human rights that people are probably most familiar with, which is about the prohibition of discrimination. But what the convention does is it shifts away from the prohibition of discrimination to a more positive aspect of human rights, a much more emancipatory side of human rights, which recognizes uh, the individual, the potential of every individual and the potential for the rest of us to celebrate human diversity and understand and support people with disabilities to meaningfully participate in their, in this context, in their service provision or in receipt of care. And instead of a focus on the disability, it seeks to assist people help themselves. So it's about recognize moving away from people as passive recipients of our decision making uh, to a place where we recognize people as participants in the exercise of their own human rights. 
helping people to participate in society, in education, in employment, in political and cultural life, and to defend their rights through accessing justice. And you will hear, I suppose there is a terminology and it's worth when you're considering the application at an operational level, it is worth looking at some of the language of the convention because it speaks to all people with disability. And that includes in particular when you're providing a service for people who may be described as nonverbal. It doesn't always mean that they cannot communicate. They may not be able to verbalize, but they're accepted internationally under the convention as being able to communicate their will and preference. And that the burden is on those of us who are providing services to support people with disability in expressing their will and preferences. And I'm sure Anya Flynn will speak more to that later on. And the other thing to note is that the UN, the Office of the High Commissioner, actually discourages governments and states from including the disability portfolio in a Department of Health or in a Department of Social Welfare, as it perpetuates the idea of either a medical model or reliance, uh, the link between social welfare and disability and reliance on the states. And we have a new department now uh, with a new minister, and hopefully we will see greater movement and accelerating in terms of disability rights. So one of the things that the human rights framework does, it puts the person at the center of the service and to support people within the service. What it also does is overwrites it, if you like, with a regulatory framework. And some of these regulations or regulatory bodies exist prior to the introduction of the UN Convention in Ireland. They'll be familiar to everybody. So the Office of the Ombudsman has a very particular role in relation to the 2005 Disability Act. The Ombudsman for Children has a very particular role in relation to the EPSIN Act and the implementation of the EPSIN Act. And then you have organisations like the Garda Ombudsman Commission, which don't immediately strike people as having a role in relation to people with disabilities, but in the course of detaining people, uh, in particular in Garda stations or in situations where um, under the mental health legislation, Gardaí may be involved in service provision. You're familiar with the health, the Mental Health Commission and the decision-making um, support unit there led by Anya Flynn. We also have the Workplace Relations Commission Act and that is a complaints handling body for people in the context of the equality legislation, whether it is equality of opportunity or equality in the context of goods and services. Then we have the more recent entrant of the Health Information and Quality Authority, um, who I would commend in terms of their efforts dating back to 2018 to very publicly describe the change in their approach. And if you look at their corporate plan, you will see a shift in language um, and Phelan Quinn has spoken about this publicly to a human rights compliant um, assessment and regulation framework. And we also have the inspector of prisons, and this is broadly speaking about disability now. And the inspector of prisons, of course, in a place of detention, the deprivation of liberty is being changed there by under that heading on development. You can see the optional protocol and the convention against torture. And that is really about, even though for some people there are the slight discomfort around the use of the term torture, if you think um, more carefully about the prevention of inhuman and degrading treatment. And essentially that's what is and will be coming down the line is a redefining of deprivation of liberty and what it means. And it will be defined beyond um, the usual places of detention that we are familiar with, like prisons, into residential and social care centres. So it will become part of the regulatory framework in the future. In addition to the optional protocol, on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, there is a regulatory framework and it will involve some of these organizations that already have a role and they will be brought together and probably coordinated um, by another authority 
that could be the inspector of prison, the ombudsman or the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. I'm not sure if that has been published yet, but there are efforts afoot to bring together what's known as a coordinating mechanism um, to have oversight of the optional protocol. And there will also be um, an effort to coordinate oversight of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, and that will be led by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission that now has a disability advisory committee. And that disability advisory committee is provided for in legislation. And it is important in terms of thinking about regulation is about thinking about how people with disabilities can participate in the governance or at different levels in your organization. So it's not simply about providing the service. And the UN Human Rights Council has identified what they describe as key attributes of good governance. These principles are familiar to everybody. Principle of transparency, responsibility, that the burden is on the people who are providing the service to support people with disability. Accountability is not new, but participation, the principle of participation is new. How you share that power for good governance with the people that you provide a service to. And in the context of St. John of God's, it's people with disabilities. How do you think about or ensure the participation of people um, in the mental health service and in the intellectual disability service. And it's also about responsiveness to the needs of the people that you serve. One of the key changes and obligations that was introduced in legislation back in 2014 was in the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act through what is known in section 42 as the public sector duty. And that is a duty to eliminate discrimination and to have regard and respect human rights. So this information is taken from the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission website, and they have a lot of material and information if you want to link in with them at an operational level to understand what it is you have to do. But the guidance outlines how you might include um, in your service, or certainly how you, not how you might, how you must comply with this new legislative obligation. And it suggests three ways of doing that. The first is you have an obligation to assess. So any public body is required to set out in a strategic and corporate plan, an assessment of the equality and human rights issues relevant to your service. The second is that the public body is required to set out its policies, its plans, and the actions it's going to take to address issues in relation to equality and human rights. And the third is about reporting in your annual report on the developments. Um, and in fact, a good model of that is to look at the HICWA model, where you can see in HICWA's corporate plan, and then you can see in their annual report how they're reporting on the development of human rights issues and actions that have been taken. And there's also an obligation on public bodies to ensure that how you communicate is communicated in a way that is fully accessible to the public. Now I have just a three minute video here that I hope will work. And it's just uh, a short video uh, helping you understand how you might implement the public sector duty. People in Ireland rely on services provided by public bodies on behalf of the state every day. From colleges and hospitals to libraries and the courts, these services are essential and it is important that they can be used by everyone. The public sector equality and human rights duty is a legal obligation on you as a public body to eliminate discrimination, promote equality of opportunity, and protect the human rights of your staff and the people who use your services when carrying out your daily work. It's a positive obligation that requires you to be proactive, to think about human rights and equality issues in your work and address them before they become a problem. The duty applies to the whole organisation, including corporate services, procurement, human resources, service provision, 
research, policy and regulatory functions. To meet the core requirements of the duty, you must assess, address and report. First, assess. You must carry out an assessment of the human rights and equality issues relevant to your work. This assessment must form a part of your strategic or corporate plan, which should be accessible to the public. The assessment should be based on evidence. Input from staff and people who use your services is key, as is using internal and external sources of information and data. Remember that equality does not always mean treating everyone the same. It is about considering the particular needs of people so that similar outcomes can be achieved. Certain people or groups of people may be more at risk than others of experiencing discrimination or human rights violations, and careful consideration must be given to include these concerns. Secondly, address. You must set out in your strategic or corporate plan the policies, plans and actions to address any issues raised in the assessment. You can include actions you may have set out under different national strategies or policies, or under the public sector reform program that are related to equality and human rights. You will need to think about positive actions you can take to meet the needs of people at risk and consider reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities. Finally, report. You must report annually on progress and achievements in a manner accessible to the public, such as your annual report. Integrating the duty into your strategic plan and annual report means that it is an ongoing obligation that must be monitored, reviewed and developed in each strategic planning cycle. The duty has the potential to positively transform how public bodies engage with members of the public and their own staff to make Ireland's public services more inclusive and more effective and to achieve an Irish society where everyone and their rights are treated with respect. The Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission has produced a guidance for public bodies on implementing the duty. You can access this guidance and learn more at ihrec.ie. Bear with me as I move to the next slide. So that was the public sector duty. Um, I think you will hear from Michael Keating um, about HICWA, how, how HICWA have approached um, their responsibility and their compliance in that regard. So in terms of concluding now and in terms of what I was asked to do by Leslie, which was look at protection of human rights, I want you to think back to those three responsibilities that people have in relation to implementing human rights. So it's about protecting, it's about respecting, and it's about fulfilling. And in particular, for those of you who are providing services, you can look at protecting and you can look at respecting by ensuring that there isn't anything that you're doing that might interfere with the rights of people with disabilities and then protecting to create policies and practices that are healthy practices that engage um, people with, dis with disabil disability disabilities than they have been in the past. So viewing disability from a human rights perspective involves an evolution in thinking and acting by states and all sectors of society so that persons with disabilities are no longer considered to be recipients of charity or objects of others' decision-making, but as active participants in the exercise of their own rights. And it's about celebrating human diversity. We know that there are 13% of Ireland's population now have a disability. And now that we do collect data, we know that that signifies over 643,000 people in Ireland who are now looking to the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability and Ireland's implementation of it. And they're doing that to ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons with disabilities, promoting respect for their inherent dignity and their freedom. So in conclusion, I would like to really in short to say that I'm delighted that you're having this conference. I'm delighted that you're exploring human rights and how the framework for human rights can place people at the center um, of a service that is human rights compliant.
a respectful service that respects people's dignity and freedom. And in my experience over many years, it has brought a huge enjoyment, um, a huge insight that I didn't have before to work alongside people with disabilities. The lens through which you look at a service becomes different. And for everybody, it is, of course, a much richer experience and a much more respectful environment in which to operate. My thanks to St. John of God's for your time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I wish you all very well. I hope the next uh, sessions today and the sessions over the coming days um, go very well for all of you. In the meantime, uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing publicly about all of the advances in human rights compliance in St. John of God's. Take care. <laughs>